So today we're going to be talking about two things. Number one is pawns. And number two is some more hunting for investors. Uh, I've been getting questions specifically around hunting for investors recently um, and what to do when you get opportunities. Let's talk about pawn calls now. I called Miguel this morning and asked him to kind of participate a little bit today because Miguel is somebody on the team who has absolutely crushed it through the pawns so far. And I want you guys to hear a little bit from him how he's found success and why. So first, Miguel, how old are you, man? Can you tell everybody how, how old you are? I am turning 23 in a few weeks from now. So 22 right now. 22. So you've been 22 this whole time, basically selling real estate. Basically, yeah. Miguel's a young guy. If you guys aren't familiar with the Monterey County market, it's a very old market as well. So it's an older demographic. And a lot of people say older demographic. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 but but what you don't hear Miguel saying ma- doing is making excuses about his age. He's committed to his business. And those of you that were at Summer to remember, I remember one panelist in particular started making excuses about her age and her production. And so that's something you never hear would hear Miguel say is that he's at a different disadvantage. And Miguel, what did you do before you started doing real estate? Before I entered the industry, I was in um, construction. So is that, is that what you meant? Like what I did right before? I just, yeah, yeah I, I was in construction for about two, about three to four years. Yeah. Three to four years. So you were about 18 when you started construction. Mm-hmm. Had you ever done sales before that? No, no, I've never done sales before that. Okay. So 22 years old, zero sales experience. Exactly. What day did you graduate? Do you remember about the date that you graduated boot camp? Uh, I want to say it was August 23rd, kind of around August. I think you might have nailed it, actually. I didn't look it up for you. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking like August 15th, but I think actually you nailed it August 23rd. It was around August 23rd, okay? So just to give you guys reference, that was about eight months ago. Counting the transaction that's getting ready to close today as two transactions because you represented both sides. How many transactions have you done in those eight months? Five. Seven. Well, okay, they were not okay. <laughs> technically seven. Technically seven. I closed. Count both because uh, you can both, sure. both sides. Yeah. It's five before today. When this one closes, it'll be seven because you're closing both sides. Yes. Plus, he just put into the chat that he's probably gonna be moving forward with his inspections on Game, which will be his highest grossing deal so far. That's a million dollar deal. That's going to be that he has had in contract. There's been some legal issues on it with the sellers, but he's he's powered through it and he's getting that one done. So Miguel is freaking crushing it. And with zero sales experience and no past real estate experience at 22 years old. So if this one closes, he'll have eight transactions in eight months. Put a one and in the more track. in the pipeline. And more in the pipeline. So you've done a lot of calling through the pond. And a lot of this has been through calling through the pond. A lot of like the skill building has been going through the pond. But tell me, what was your number one activity that you kept trying to do before you were trying to call through the pond? What was the one thing you were like hammering your head against the wall, trying to do it, trying to do it, but not finding success? I was uh, door knocking, I would say. I was door knocking around, trying to form my neighborhood. Um, I didn't get the most success from it, but I did get my very first listing appointment through door knocking. Unfortunately, I didn't get it. But um, honestly, like I remember walking out of the listing appointment and feeling like, you know, that took a lot of time to get there. And I don't know if I got the listing agreement, but I know I learned a lot about how to present myself, how to kind of manage and maneuver the whole process. And I felt super confident in myself for the next listing appointment after that. But overall, door knocking in general, um, it has its successes, but I was basically banging my head against the wall with it. So why did you pick door knocking as the first thing to try? It was something I I felt like face-to-face interaction was going to go a lot further compared to cold calling. I hear this a lot, Miguel. I hear this this thing a lot, a lot, a lot. So yeah, I I figured face to face interaction would be you know a good way to start building relationships. It did kind of work with some people. I do still nurture them, but for the most part, a lot of people didn't like that. And also, it was very time consuming, and I felt like the return on my time investment to it and the lead that I was getting back 
just didn't compare as to like when I started cold calling and my database started to grow a lot more exponentially compared to when I was door knocking. And that, that's, I, I, that's the first thing I noticed. So in one hour's time, what would you, how many people, how many doors do you estimate you could door knock in one hour's time? You know, that depends on who opens the door and is willing to talk to me. <laughs> but assuming some people wanted to talk to me, I could probably really only do like five to 10. And that's not really a lot. Okay. Like if, if they wanted to talk to me, that's not a lot. Okay. And then calling, how many do you think you could do? Like four times the amount at minimum. So closer to 20. I remember you're doing this and you, you kind of shared with me like, I'm spending so much time doing this. You're covering a lot of ground and you kind of made the decision like, Hey, I'm going to start focusing on the phones. So why do you think you shied away from the phones at first? Like I said, I just, I just felt like when I was, I remember studying for my test and I would talk to people telling them I'm going to join real estate. They they were always telling me like, you know, make sure you make that face-to-face -face interaction. It seemed like that was like the biggest thing people really wanted from an agent. So um, cold calling didn't really make too much sense to me. And that's why I, that's why I, I went with door knocking at first. So you, you've grown your database significantly over the last eight months. And I think you have like, I forgot to have it up ahead of time, but I think you have like 625 people in your database now. I think so. I think so around there. 625 people in your database been doing this for like 15 months. And then you have eight, eight deals in a close in the last eight months. So I just, I just think that's amazing, man. Like I wanted to like tip my hat to you. I think that's amazing what you've done, like how much effort you've put into this and, and the results show. So what's been your experience now, like specifically calling into the pond? Right now, I would say I, I, I noticed now that I've been in, in it for a year, I've noticed kind of the different attitudes around the season. But like, you know, like when I call around wintertime, for example, no, not a lot of people want to talk because they're like, oh, I'm going away from vacation, you know. But um, they're also like I did notice at the same time. Like their willingness to say, like, you know, I'm not really looking right now, but hey, call me in six months. We can talk, you know, it, and, it's, and that's I always kind of look at it as planting a seed. You know, that is basically what you do as a real estate agent. You're planting seeds everywhere you go, whether you're cold calling or door knocking or meeting someone at the, or you just run into someone who's talking about real estate at the supermarket. You're planting seeds and it's a long term game. And that's kind of how I look at it with cold calling. I, yeah, some people tell me to fuck off, but you know, two days later, I see them looking through our website. It's like, okay, well, I'll, I'll check in with you three months from now and see if you're still interested. If you tell me to fuck off, I'll check, I'll check in another three to six months. Um, it's, it's kind of just, it's a long-term game. And I think you, if you have the stomach for it, like it'll, it'll pay off. I think that what you just said is like so important. It's all about planting seeds. It's a long-term game because I don't think you've closed a transaction specifically from pawn yet, but it's gotten you a huge database. You have a lot of you have a huge pipeline. How has this though affected you on your on your transactions that you have done when you get that warm introduction? Um, from from my pond lead specifically, like like working this muscle of practicing the calls. How has that affected you then when you get the warm leads, the warm introductions? What's what's been the what's been the relation of the two? Well, it's like you first told me when I first started, and I, you know you're, you're going to get like ninety nine no's before you get that one yes. But those ninety nine no's, even if half of them just are just no's, the other half you still have conversations with them. It's basically a role play. They completely set me up for for those warmer leads, so that I was ready and I I knew what I was talking about. Like sometimes I just you know sometimes I, I missed a property on the market. And I'm talking to a lead and, and they bring up that, par that property. So I'm looking into it more. And then five calls later, we're talking about that same property. And now I know about it. You know, like it, it's completely set me up for success with those warm leads. I would say so. That's so cool. You said it's basically a role play. It's like a low pressure opportunity for you guys to have conversations with people. And because role play is great because you're practicing what you're saying. But oftentimes the person when they're role playing with you, they're not giving you like very realistic responses back. Right. So the pawn lead is like a low consequence way to like figure out exactly what people are going to say back to you. And so that way, when the warm lead says something back to you, you're like, I've seen this before. Exactly. I know what to exactly. do. I know what to do now. And, so, and it's such a good feeling. Like it feels like it paid off, even though you didn't, you're not at the sale part yet. Like you, yeah. all the practice paid off. Yeah, exactly. 
Okay. I'm going to keep coming back to you uh, on when I'm talking about other things, but I'm going to, I'm going to start moving now too, but thanks for all that, Miguel. That's super helpful. Okay. Who here has seen an email that looks like this? Are you guys clicking on the view full details to see, see what, see what's going on? Because oh, like on this particular one, I didn't look at it ahead of time. I just found like the first one in my inbox because this one's still sitting in the pond. So like everybody who's in this pond, the prospective tenant San Jose got this email, but, but I don't see anybody who called it and tried to claim it. This guy requested to schedule a showing on a property in the MLS. So if you guys are getting these emails, make sure you click on view, view, view full lead details and see what's going on and call them and try to claim this. This is a person raising their hand, interested in the property, and we let it go by. Uh, hey Kyle, I think I only get those with people that are already in my leads. I don't think I don't think I get the whole team's um, views property. Great, great, great question, Xavier. I'm glad you asked that. So, if you're not getting these emails, go to your profile, click on My Notification Settings, and come down to Specific Pond. Look, it's even highlighted. <laughs> specific Pond Lead Action Alerts. Email me. Make sure it's set to email me. And you could even set to um, notify me in the mobile app too. I don't know. I haven't had great experiences with the notify, notify me in the mobile app. I think it might have like some settings on my phone that are blocking those. So I like to get emails. But that way you can start getting those and then you can click on them. Xavier, you'll only get them for the pawns that you're assigned to though. Okay. So if you guys didn't see that, go to my notification settings. You can click on this, my notification settings, scroll down. To specific pawn lead election alert and email me. Make sure you're getting those because Carlos here viewed this property five times and nobody scooped him up. And then Sherry's another one here. She came to the web back to the website after 202 days. That means for six months we've been emailing her with her having zero interest. She all of a sudden today got the urge to start looking at properties again. Probably a good person to call on, right? There's probably some motivation there. All right, so now just like an overview, overview of pawns real quick is number one, make sure you're working those notifications because those are, those are like the easiest layups ever. Okay, so now when you guys are in your pawns, you guys are gonna have, let me go to like, well, I'll go to Miguel. So when you're in the pawns, you have an option of pawns to select from. So what you don't want to do is have select all, because if you have all pawns selected, we're not using the same scripts for expired that we're using for FBO, FRBO, that we're using for old leads, that we're using prospective tenants, right? They're all different. So we need to have different types of conversations with them. So we want to make sure we're selecting, I believe old leads to be the best ones to call upon. And all of you guys have different pawn sizes. So like, I'm not going to lie to you guys, Miguel does have the best pawn size. He's calling in the area that we've been in the longest, monitoring Salinas, he probably has like, well, I'll tell you right here, he's 4,925 people that he could possibly call. Like, that's a lot, right? More than he could possibly call through. So, like, Alondra, I think you have, like, 10 right now. <laughs> so, all things aren't equal, right? But, that being said, there's four different filters you want to use when you're calling through the pond. So, specifically for old leads, you want to go straight to your pond user's call because this is your hand raisers in the database. So right now in Miguel's um, pond, there is probably going to be a high amount of people raising their hands. He has 18, there's 18 people in here that are raising their hands, basically saying, coming back to the website, make, doing stuff on the website. I got to clean that up. <laughs> no, no, no. This is, this is what, this is what everybody has access to. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is the pond users call. So pond users call is a smart filter of people who are in the pond that are looking at websites. So Miguel does have the biggest database to call into, but even if you have a small one, like Alondra, look at this, if we go to old leads for Alameda County and we go to the pond users call, even on this, there's four people in here. Is anybody in here complaining about four, four hand raisers in their database that they could possibly get? To, Absolutely to, not. So Moss in here is 10 visits on our website. Even though Miguel, you can be like, oh, Miguel, well, Miguel has so much opportunity. Well, there's also is also people who have, might have a smaller database to call on. You, if you're calling zero of the people, you have the same you have the same amount of opportunity as anybody else, right? Because you're utilizing zero. And then even if you look at prospective tenants, I don't know if actually the prospective tenants in Alameda is working right now. 
think the San Jose one was the one I want to show you. Look at San Jose. Oh yeah, no, just an Alameda. Alameda prospective tenants have, for hand raisers has another six people in it too. That could be all that are looking at properties online right now. These are easy people to grab. They're just sitting in the database. They're good people to practice on, and they could be your next transaction, or they could be a transaction for 2025. Like Miguel said, you're planting these seeds. So after you've gone through pawn users call and there's nobody else left to call, the next one you want to go to is your cold prospecting call. Because that's going to be people who haven't got a call in the last 30 days. Then you want to go through your landline prospecting call. Those are the same thing as cold prospecting call. They're just people who have landlines. For a launch there, you have 261 people to call through. It's going to take you a little bit of time, Hamburger, huh, to call through those people. And then, and then also gold is the new new person new people call. So these are people who are new in the database in the last 30 days and haven't got a call in the last two. So there's 30 people in here too. So there's people who are just registered on the website that are new. So good opportunities there for old leads, prospective tenants. And then we also have expireds in here. So like if you guys want to start working expired listings, I talked to one of the agents today on the team. It expired June of 2023. Um, they ended up renting it instead, and now they're looking to list this summer. So call, call on those older ones as well. And then FRBO, you guys know I love FRBO calls. Um, there's FRBO plants in here as well. You know, a tremendous amount of people in there. You want to serve my registered newest. And you don't have to only call them about property management. You can also call them about would they consider selling this property and... If they're a buyer on future properties that you can find for them. So Miguel, what, so I know your best experience is definitely on calling the old leads. Tell me about the experience on calling on the and prospecting prospective tenants. So with them, it's definitely going to be a longer term. I mean, we picked them up initially as a, as a prospective tenant. They're looking to rent. Like, for example, I was I actually just got off the phone yesterday with someone who their lease ends in June. And they're really, really unsure whether or not they want to um, renew the lease or start looking into a new home. And we were kind of going back and forth. Honestly, it was kind of like a toga war. But they did mention that. You know, if they found something in Marina that would be more attractive to her because her mom's in Marina. Well, I have a listing coming up in Marina. No pressure, but hey, come by to the open house. You can check it out and we can just formally meet um, and you can really go whenever you want. But yeah, that's it was just kind of my way of inviting that prospective tenant that I talked to about like eight months ago. And just I've just been nurturing her. So there they are longer nurturing leads. But like I said earlier, what I noticed in this business is you're really just planting seeds everywhere you go. And um, I think something else that's really good to note is like you said a while ago, you're not necessarily trying to cast them all like a Pokemon. Um, you do still want to focus more on converting them. A lot of, you know, especially in this market, we all know a lot of people are having a hard time trying to enter the market. So why not just plant a seed for now and continue nurturing them? Because it does pay off. Eventually they reach out to you. Like I've seen them reach out to me because I've just been nurturing them for so long when they have questions, not necessarily jumping into the market, but they came to me. So I know they trust me. So most of the time on these prospective tenants, they're most of the time going to be nurturers. But we still need to sell houses in 2025. We still need to sell houses in 2026 and 27. We're in this, you guys have to be in this business for the long game. Um, and I know a lot of us need to make money now, um, but you're going to be really happy in 2028 when you walk into the year with three people who you know you want to buy that year, right? Or, you know, hopefully more than that. But um, And then, yes, so most of the time they are going to be long-term nurtures, but Austin, he's not on the call today. He landed one that it was like, you know what, actually... I would buy instead of renting and they ended up buying a $1.6 million house and closed on it cash in like 15 days. So it's not impossible to find that person. And so if you look at here at like Fresno, for example, Fresno has five prospective tenants who are um, looking at properties for sale as well right now. And they have this particular one, John Yang has four, four views and two properties that they've saved. I'd say that person's a pretty high intent person if they've saved properties. So the data, the database will like kind of tell you some of these things too. So you can even like cherry pick who you're calling. So it doesn't have to only be an effort game. You can play it smart. The trick is though, like checking it every day and looking for that. Cause if you don't check it for three weeks, well, then you missed all those people that were in that three week period. And let me, if I, if I could just add, um, all the sales I had from this year were specifically from 
planting my seeds last year. Like, you know, that's, that's kind of how it works. So everything I'm picking up this year, I'm, I'm, I'm nurturing what I already worked last year and I'm eventually setting myself up for work for next year and the year after that. So that, that's kind of what I've noticed as well. Yep. Yeah. So rarely is the person you're talking to now closing the next 30 days It's usually six to nine months down the road. So you have to, you have to know that that's the case. So you start planting the seeds now so they can come to fruition at that time. Okay. So now something, a question that I've gotten a lot is, or, or people, the situation that just come up a lot is getting off market properties and going to hunt for an investor or vice versa, getting an investor and going to hunt for off market property. So I wanted to kind of talk about that, about that a little bit first. So first I'm going to ask for some participation from you guys. So if our goal right now is to find a property that's off market, where are some of the places we can find them? MLS. MLS. Yeah. We can go hunt for them. In the MLS. We talked to other agents in the network. Oh, that have some... It's a great one. Yes. Wholesalers. That's my favorite. Wholesalers. I love you just said that, Xavier. Where are you finding your wholesalers? There's a few different ways. I found one from a realtor friend. Also, just social media, Facebook, Instagram. Um, there's some different ones around the Bay Area. There's also just different groups. The best one that I have, I stumbled on talking to a realtor friend that he already had here. I'm, I'm not, I don't even know how he found them, but they're yeah. one of my favorite ones. So start networking and asking for wholesalers. Guys, start asking for wholesalers. They have off-market properties that you can start dangling out to investors. Yeah. They'll help your investors. So Xavier named asking other agents, Facebook groups. If you like go search on Facebook for wholesaling groups, you can find them there. Um, if you Google search, like we buy ugly houses, sell your house fast for cash. If you start Googling shirts or just stuff like that, like what would a, what would a person who needed to sell their house fast, Google, Google that. And the people who you're look, these wholesalers will come up because that's what they're targeting is people who are searching for that stuff. You will find so many wholesalers. If you go, if you go just Google search right now, sell your home fast for cash, Sacramento, you'll get all the wholesalers in Sacramento right there, all the top ones. And then you can call them, ask to get on their distribution list. Say, Hey, I work with a lot of investors. Can I get on your distribution list? And Xavier, so they put out these distribution lists just by like email, right? Like you just get emails with good properties in your inbox, right? Uh, yeah, I get text messages, but yeah, same thing. And the group I'm in, it's it's usually a few a week. And these guys are trying to use leverage. They're trying to go fast. They're trying to throw, they're like using the shotgun method where they're just trying to put a large web out to try to catch somebody who can buy their property. Yeah, and usually from, from what I've seen, it's like they, they, they leak it out about a week before a showing date and then they have a showing date and then the day after the showing date they do offer so it's pretty quick i mean with those sales i think they wrap it up and it's like a 30-day close or something or the yeah. the contract is only 30 days or something like that so, you need to get done really quick depending yeah. on, sometimes they're doing a double close sometimes they're assigning the contract yeah and so they usually need to get it turned around quickly. Yeah. So you can use these. What I'm talking right now is these carrots that you can use to dangle to go find your investors and to service the investors you have. Lonnie is big with wholesalers. He's bought he's bought multiple properties that he's gotten from wholesalers. And he just did a transaction with the, an investor that he got from an investment partner. He signed him up for property management. And then his wholesaler told him about a wholesale deal. He took his investor. They bought that house, showed him one house and they closed because it was a good deal. And just so you guys know what wholesaling is, wholesalers basically do marketing to go find people who need to sell their house fast for cash. They'll go put it in a contract and then they'll sell that contract. So they're not actually looking to sell the house. They're looking to sell the paper contract. They get it locked up in a good deal at a good price that they know an investor can make money on the back end. And then they'll put a fee on it depending on how they do the, the transaction. They can either double close or assign the contract. And so how much money they put on it will kind of depend on which method they use. Because if they do the if they do the assignment method, then the seller sees how much money they made on it. So they don't typically like to do that. If they do the double close, it costs them a little bit more, but they can hide how much they made. So they can make like a big back end, but they have to really negotiate on the front end if they do that. What other things can we do to, to line off markets? Would investment partner count as one? Yeah. So you get an investment partner. This is a great one, Miguel. So if you have an investment partner lead and they tell you that they would consider selling, especially if it's a house that needs a lot of work and, it, and they want to rent it out, ask them if they would like, hey, if you got an offer, would you consider it? You can go take that offer now and go shop it to all your investors. Guess how what guess, investors are going to all freaking love you because you have an off-market property that the, the seller doesn't even know they want to sell yet. They're just kind of thinking about it. That's where the investor wants them. That's where they want to want to learn about them.
And that's just kind of like what Xavier said too. They're trying to do things like a week ahead of time, right? Because that's when it's hot. And then if, because if you wait 10 days later, it's too late. So investors want it before it gets to that point. They want to know about it before other people did. I did that. I, the Winton property. That's right. I started shopping it out two weeks before we were going to put it on the market. Started shopping it out to a bunch of wholesalers and investors who contact me asking more, asking me for off market opportunities. So I did the reverse on them. I got one to commit to our seller's number with some back and forth negotiation and uh, we're in contract. So we expect to close in two weeks. And now you have a list of investors to work with, right? Now JS, now people know JS pull, pulls off market properties that investors can close on. And now investors are going to want to work with him. Uh, what what other stuff do we have? I mean, we could do mailers to find properties for our buyers, or that's I don't know if that's the same cost rack. Mailers are definitely an option. What else can we do? I haven't had too much success with it yet, but I always like when I, I drive around a lot, and I always mark down properties that look just run down. Yeah, and I and I try to like door knock them or cold call them later on. It's called bird dogging. That's a great activity. You see something with boards on the windows or really tall grass, you can bird dog them, mail them, knock, and call them. You said already MLS, but specifically coming soon's. So each MLS has their own version of coming soon's. So you can use these to dangle out to investors, especially if they're they look like fixers. Austin awesome locked up a property that was a fixer upper coming soon. And then they they assigned the contract then to Kevin's investor. So they so Austin awesome made money on that assignment. Kevin's investor bought it, flipped it. Now it's coming back to the market here in the next like six, uh, three months. So both of them made money on, on doing that. And that was on a coming soon one. And then um, expired and canceled. So I mentioned that already. Go back through those expires, especially if you can find properties that are dilapidated. Guys, properties did not sell in October and November of 2024, 2023. Like there's a lot of expired listings from that period of houses that didn't sell just only because of market conditions. Find developers in your favorite zip code by doing those, by, by looking at who's flipped properties in the past and reaching out to them saying, hey, what inventory do you have coming? Uh, Cause I have people who are looking to buy and they, they'll lock something up before you finish it. And then my last one that I had listed was attend investor meetups. So like I know Sawyer, you've been going to the investor meetups. They have a port part in the beginning where people can go up at the microphone and announce what, what type of deals they have or what they're looking for. Write down that info, introduce yourself to them afterwards. And there you have a buyer or a seller already in your database. So where are those uh, investor meetups? Where are you seeing those uh, like posted like for days and times? Uh, if you do meetup.com, you'll, you'll find them on meetup.com. Usually it's how I found them in the past. Like I used to live in Sacramento when I did that. I used to go to them up in Sacramento and I'd always find them on meetup.com. We don't have any here in Monterey locally. Um, I'd also look on bigger pockets. Um, and then bigger pockets is another great way to find your wholesalers and investors, biggerpockets.com in the forums. They have like area specific forums. Okay, so now what to do once you have the property? Cause, cause we got, we got the prize. It's like, we know we got the property. We know everybody wants it. Like JS just described it. He found a property. He had a property using the list as a fixer upper. Sawyer right now has an investment partner deal where it needs a ton of work and he's going to be doing all, he's going to be helping him with all the work. Um, Xavier shared that he has wholesalers texting him deals. So it's like, how do we leverage this now to get people who are like, just to fill our database of people who want to work with us. So a couple things, number one, deal of the week. So this is an example of deal of the week. This is a big Sharon thing. He's been teaching this for a long time. So I did this for three weeks, got three leads on investors. And so it has to be super basic. It can't, it can't be fancy. Then put the subject. So you'd say conquered deal of the week. This deal of the week is a single family home in this neighborhood of Concord. I don't know Concord well in some of the neighborhoods. Uh, three beds, two, but like all the same information. Notice there's no link to the property, no picture. And if you're interested, just reply and I'll get you all the details. And the reason why it's in this format is because conversion is in the conversation. And so what you don't want to do is be like, hey, 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 look at this property I have. Look at, look at, look at, and give them a link in the address because then they can just go check it out on their own. But if you do a deal of the week like this, then they have to hit reply to get more information from you, right? And so then you can enter in a conversation. So I highly recommend starting to do this. And then the most important key for this too, though, is to remain consistent. And so don't overthink what your deal of the week has to be. It doesn't actually have to be like a flip, fix and flip property. It doesn't have to be a 
property that's going to have an 8% cap rate. It can be just a, a, a cool house that you think is going to sell fast. And you know who has those? Redfin. You just go on and look at what's a hot home on Redfin. That could be your deal of the week anytime you don't have actually one that's like good for an investor. So it's still a house that's going to sell pretty quick. It has a high mass appeal to it, right? A lot of people are still going to be interested in seeing that. So that's deal of the week. I was just going to ask. So those are like what you're emailing straight to, you know, prospective people, right? You know, not like just posting it on Instagram or social media and doing the same thing. Yeah. You can do it on social media too. Don't expect to get like a ton of conversions from social media. So, so here's the thing about social media. So social media, if you say you have a thousand followers and you post something, only about 15% of your database is going to see that. Where if you email a database of people who know who know you, like a warm, that's considered a warm list, your open rate should be around 65%. There's way more conversion in email. Email lists are actually way more valuable than social media is. And you have the same shareability of emails because they can forward that to somebody else. Like one of the leads that I got when I was doing deal of the week was a guy emailed me and said, hey, my dad just forwarded me your email. Can I get put on this list? I'm interested in buying in the next 12 months. So it has the same shareability as like Instagram does, but people actually read it because on Instagram, people are doing this. They're flipping, flipping through and a little text box isn't really catching their eye and they're not really reading descriptions, but emails, they are reading it. Okay. Number two is text message to investors about the property, people who have bought cash. So looking that up, people who have sold flips. And then you can also send these text messages cold to FRB owner, FRBO owners that you can go and go look for in the pond, or you can go find their phone numbers on Craigslist. So it's so, so simple, right? You can start building your database doing this. Jayesh, when you started sending it out to the whole, all the wholesalers and all the, and all the flippers, how did you find those people to start sending it out to? Uh, text messages, people who contacted me, I've just sent it back in reverse. Who were those people? Employees of the different groups. Like for example, there's this group called the Hive group llc uh colonial investment properties so all of these guys so whatever means they've used to communicate with me i just use to reverse communicate back with them reverse that so your your text could look something like this this is also from sharon not sure if this is the right fit for you i came across a property that every every modesto uh investor should look at you know 250k needs 20k in work three bedroom two bath would you like the details that you can share with anyone that might be interested? Yeah. So that's basically what I did. Um, I typed it up as, you know, four bed, two bath, so many square feet. This is the ARV, but current home value is about this much with this much estimated. Well, not, I didn't say estimated. I said it's a light to medium rehab. If you're interested, call me for more. Yeah. And the last thing you can do is by call. Hey, Jayesh, this is a super quick business call. Can I share something with you? What if I told you I came across a property that pay you to own it? Would you like those details? Uh, yes, please. <laughs> but if you're somebody who's already finding good deals, start using these methods because investors are going to start hitting you up about like, there's Xavier, what you're finding is people are going to start calling you like, hey, hey, Xavier, I need to get a new project under contract. Do you have anything coming up? Because like these these contractors and these these guys, they have crews that they have to keep busy, and if they don't, they lose these guys, and so they almost sometimes have to buy 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 their jobs, and so you can you can be the person that they start coming to they start coming to you when they need something. I have a question on wholesalers. So I was always told that wholesalers were like bad. Don't they're a waste of time. How do you get paid off of, you know, buying or selling something with a wholesaler? Okay. So the specific deal that you're getting from them, honestly, Alondra, is probably not where you're going to get paid. So where you, how you would get paid is they would have to split their wholesale commission with you, which is a possibility. Um, like that's, so that's what Lonnie did on the last one he did. But what you're, what you're actually using this for is you're using their properties that they have as bait to get investors. And then, so then you have direct contact with these investors and they want to have, and they want to work with you. So you're not going just for that one quick hit. Like Miguel said, you're planting these seeds because it can lead to a much better um, experience than just splitting the wholesale with the view of somebody. Cause a wholesale fee could be as small as like $5,000. Right. And so like a lot of you guys sell houses, they get paid commissions much higher than that. 
Like Ooh. I personally don't love the business of wholesaling. Um, I've, I've done it a little bit before and it like, I think you're better off just going to the traditional route. There's already been a very, very easy path to drive down that's been paved for you, or you can go the tough route with the wholesaling is my personal opinion. Not to say that those that's the wrong decision. I'm just saying that's been my personal experience. So try to use it to build relationships with Wanda. Don't think of it as I'm going to get paid for this specific house. Got it. Thank you. I appreciate it. But it is possible to get paid on the house. I'm not saying you, you, that won't happen. I'm just saying think of this. Think about playing the long game. Like if you if you do have an investor that buys the house, fixes it up, and then now they want to sell it back in in six months, put it back on the market after that, so they can get their flip fee. You know, then you can potentially be. Their there, listing. You there you go. And then you're listing it, like say they buy it for like 400, but it's going to sell for, you know, 900,000 or 1.2 million or whatever. Like you got the better side of that commission. And then now that, that investor is going to freaking love you. If you're cold calling investors, you know, there's different tricky ways to, you know, find out, cat find cash buyers and find other investors. Um, You said some others today, like meetups and bigger pockets, but like when you're first cold calling an investor, I'm curious, like, what that verb is, you know, like, what's a, you know, you know, just so that it's not salesy and it's not, you know, like, and they don't know you, though. And they, but they're very well, uh, well versed in the business, you know, so it's not like it's a pond call where, you know, this is like a tr regular traditional client. You know, these are people. So, that so there's two. So number one is if you have a, a, a traditional buyer, you can call them up and say, hey, I have a traditional buyer that's looking to buy in Benicia right now. Um, do, do you happen to have any projects you're currently working on in that area or have any friends that are working on? So, cause I have a buyer who's looking to lock something up as soon as possible. And so you're not calling them to like do flips. You're just calling them because they might have something to sell you because investors love to sell their projects before they finish them. Cause it removes all the risk, which is the worst part about flipping houses is the risk. So if you, if they can sell a project before they finished it, then that's huge value to them. So they're going to love that. And then in that conversation, you'd be like, hey, well, you know, like I also have some good deals come across my desk. What's your buy box? But that's an easy way to start the conversation. Um, the other one is if you have a property, just being like, hey, I came across a property that would pay you to own it. Is that something you'd want to know more about? The most efficient way is for sure um, sending out a mass email with the property of the week. So um, you could do MailChimp is going to be your highest deliverability. They have a free free membership. I shared, I think it was like up to 2,000 emails per month. Um, you can also do a mass email through Sierra. There are deliverability issues when you do that. So that's why I recommend the MailChimp version, but I'll show you quickly how you do do that. You can, you can also just BCC email it to people um, if you want to be quick about it. Um, so just, you know, send it to yourself and BCC it. So from your leads, you can create your list, um, through different tags or whatever have you. And then with bulk actions, you can send an email and send an email through here. So that's how you do it through Sierra. I just personally have had poor experiences with deliverability and deliverability is your most important metric when you're doing email marketing. When they receive that email, does it come from like our personal C2 email or is it like something that says Sierra or like, how does that come through to them? Comes from your yeah. personal C2. Comes from your personal C2. It'll say Melanie. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. It's a two-way sync with, with Gmail. And I think that's what causes some of the deliverability issues is the, is the syncing. Um, cause there's a backend company called SendGrid that's supposed to be with the server. I think it's just like too many hands in the pot with the email deliverability. MailChimp is going to be by far your best. If this is something you're gonna, like really committed to doing, I'd recommend doing MailChimp. Even if you pass the threshold of needing to pay for it, the lowest level thing is like 25 bucks a month. And then once you get like, I have like a 90, 90,000 person list. So like I'm paying 600 bucks a month, but I also got in trouble for that list. So <laughs> don't be like me. Don't be in trouble with it. All right. Well, if you guys have follow-up questions, let me know. Um, and hope you guys start uh, using everything that Miguel shared with us today and uh, start building a 600-person database where you can get eight deals in eight months, just like that. Talk to you guys soon.